so much going on, very exciting, even though it's summer. Usually summer is kind of just stuff kind of gets kind of, you know, slow. But this summer, lots of stuff going on. A big one is on August 8th, Sunday, August 8th, after this service, so 1145, uh, we're celebrating the 65th anniversary of Hank and Betty Lou Glickon. Uh, as Betty Lou likes to say, she's only 49, so it's amazing. They've been married for 65 years, however that works, we, we give it to her. Um, but uh, their family is going to be providing a taco truck for all of us, so uh, tacos to celebrate. We're very thankful for that gift, and uh, it'll just be a great celebration of a great family in the church being married for 65 years. Um, that, uh, that is just amazing, and we're so thankful for that. Also, uh, if you haven't signed up yet for one of the summer dinners at, at uh, mine and, and Bethany's home, we've been having a great time learning so much about people. In fact, people that have been in the church a very long time have been finding out new things about each other that they never knew. So, and it's all good, all good stuff, you know, uh, nothing bad. We, we've just been having a great time. So if, if you haven't signed up yet and you'd like to come by, just have a meal and chat and talk uh, around the table. Having you. Uh, another couple announcements that are great for this summer is number one, our handbell and choir, choir, handbell choir and choir, choir. Uh, they're not uh, singing in church or, or playing the bells in church over the summer. But as we're getting ready to start the fall, as we're looking for a new uh, music director, we want to make sure we have as many people in church as possible that really would enjoy being a part of either the handbell choir or the choir or both, uh, have an opportunity to come and, and learn. So uh, on every Wednesday, the time has changed to 7.30. Evidently that worked better for folks. So it says 7 in the bulletin. But every Wednesday over the summer, uh, Murda is graciously providing handbell lessons. It doesn't matter whether you've never played the bells before, if you're experienced with the bells, it's a time to polish your skills and also to learn from scratch. Uh, these are beautiful instruments, and they're an instrument that uh, can be, uh, you can learn to play even if you've never played any other instrument before. But it, it's such a, a wonderful thing to make beautiful music for the Lord in worship, and uh, I'm just really excited that come the fall and when we bring in our new music director, we just have all the folks from the church that would like to share their voices and, and, uh, and music with the Lord regardless of their experience level. And speaking of uh, participating in, in the, the church service and worship, the worship services that, that we come to and, and, and come and, and worship the Lord every Sunday take a lot of folks to, to make happen. We have altar guild that takes care of all the, the pyramids and makes sure that uh, the communion is prepared. We have worship readers making sure that everyone that comes in our door is welcome, whether they've been here a million years or it's their very first day. These are very important people. Our ushers to keep a, an orderly movement into the, the communion service, make sure everything is safe and that everybody has a bulletin. All of these uh, positions uh, are, are so important in serving the needs of the church. And again, over the summer, we want to build them up. We want to kind of polish our procedures and would like to invite anybody that's interested in serving in these areas, please put your name on the bulletin or just call the church office and let us know. And then we'll eventually kind of have a big meeting, probably a lunch, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure we uh, get everybody on board with the way everything works. And you can have an opportunity to be a part of serving in, in the worship of God's church. Anyways, that's a lot of announcements. Let's get to what we're really here for today, the worship of our beloved Savior. I know he is going to bless us in his house today. The peace of Christ. <laughs>
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful to us, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Merciful God, 
the protector of all who trust in you. Strengthen our faith and give us courage to believe that in your love, you will rescue us from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Genesis, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse 8. And God said to Noah and his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of God. Thanks. 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 The epistle reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you rise from the reading of the Holy Gospel? Church body can 
confess the core truths of those holy scriptures this morning in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Mm -hmm. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died because of his He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will not judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Tells us in verse 48, 
But Jesus sees the disciples out there in, on the sea, the wind going against them. And it says they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. These are rather unhappy disciples, I would think, at the moment. Can you imagine how frustrating? Probably got the oars out, just uh, trying to go exhausted, tired, barely making any progress. And then, of course, Jesus comes walking by on the water, you know, as one is wont to do. And I, I love the first assumption of the, of the disciples, it's a ghost. I, I love how it just says that. They could have let him off the hook and, and left that out. But of course, there are, it's a ghost. I mean, can you imagine the internal discussion with the disciples? Of, of, of whose ghost is this? Or did it cast for the ghost? Or whatever. But they completely lose it. They're afraid. So exhausted and afraid. Then, of course, Jesus gets in the boat, stills the wind, and they end up being utterly astounded. So this morning, I, I, in the back of our minds, I just want us to think of that progression, that sense of frustration, of just rowing against the wind or, or trying to sail against the wind and feeling like you're not getting anywhere. You're exhausted. You're tired. Maybe you want to just give up and turn around. And then you go from that into absolute panic and fear. Things are out of control. What's going on? This is, is crazy. And then ending up just being amazed at something so wonderful you could have never imagined. And what I'm wondering is, is, is there better ways to get to the astounding part? Can we make things a little easier being in the boat? Because I think all of us in some way or another, whether it's now or in the recent past or sometime in the near future, can really relate to the feeling of the disciples of being stuck, of being exhausted, of feeling like you're not making any headway. I think we can all relate to that feeling of being terrified. The world turns upside down. We just had a major pandemic. That Those times when you're cruising along the road and all of a sudden something happens that you, you almost get into a car accident and you're... You know, your adrenaline is flying at a thousand miles an hour, terrified. But the ultimate goal here is this wonderful feeling of astounding. Look at what the Lord is doing. And if we go to the end of the text, in verse 51, Jesus gets in the boat with the disciples who have gone from exhausted to afraid and then to astounding. Or before even getting this down, he said in verse 52 that they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So if we start with kind of the end of this miracle account in Scripture, we can kind of start with what the problem was. Even though the disciples saw Jesus do this miraculous event with taking a little bit of food and feeding thousands of people, they still kind of didn't believe with their eyes folded, but their hearts were hard. This isn't possible. This is not the way things work. Um, it, it's just not human nature to accept things that human nature has not experienced. And I think this text reminds us something very important about the Christian life, which is every day, every morning, the moment we wake, we should start the day with a broken heart, not a heart. Not a heart that just says, oh, I've got this, I'm strong, I've, I've got this all covered. May have a few little problems, but overall, pretty good stuff here. Look in the mirror, flex your muscles. Or, as opposed to starting the day with the broken heart. While it's tough to think about, we need to realize from Holy Scripture that everything around us, including ourselves, is sinful and broken and failing. Whether it's the earth itself, whether it's the home that we live in, whether it's the car we're driving, whether it's our bodies as they're getting old, everything's falling apart. And the truth is that regardless of how the morning starts, we're going to goof up during the day and do things we regret, say things we wish we wouldn't have said, we're going to fail. What if we start off with that feeling of repentance, that I am broken? Admitting that we need somebody else. This last Wednesday, uh, uh, doing chapel for the preschoolers, 
if you ever want to see a great example of people that are rather open to new ideas or what other people say, preschoolers are still there. They don't think they have it all together. They realize how much they need the, the older folks. But the, 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 uh, the lesson for the preschoolers for chapel was Jesus and the miraculous catch, catch with the net with the, with the disciples. And I couldn't really figure out anything to do with the net that would not create some sort of harm with preschoolers. So I cheated a little bit and we used a fishing pole. So I made a big fishing pole out of a Nerf um, a pool noodle thing with a wire on it, put a blue sheet over the pews. And then uh, my wife and I found these rubber fish at Target, which had a little round thing on the end and we wrote the Bible verse on the fish and then the kids would one at a time come up and cast their pole and, and say how powerful Jesus was and, and then I would put a fish on their hook and say I think you got something and they were excited and, and delighted and no we're not doing that today um, you know somebody after last service said how come we don't get things fun like that but thought it was this great idea and uh, but preschoolers you never know what they're going to say and at the beginning when I was telling them what happened in the account of scripture, I asked them, I said, do you know why it was so frustrating not to catch any fish? I said, because that was their dinner. That's what they ate and they didn't have any fish to eat. And I said to the kids, do any of you like fish? And they all started to share when they had fish last and they like fish. But one little sweet little girl raised her hand and says, I don't eat fish. My family's vegetarian. Oh, that's okay, that's okay too, that's okay too, that's good. But then at the very end of the chapel, when, when all, everybody had gotten their fish and, and the poor teachers are trying to organize the kids now that I've stirred them all up, but they, they are sitting up there with their little fish and they're singing their closing songs, right? And they're, they're getting ready to leave. And while they're singing their last song, I see this, this adorable little girl looking at her fish, the one from the vegetarian family, and while everybody's singing, she brings it up and takes a bite out of it. And number one, she will never eat fish now. She's going to say, no wonder, no wonder our family doesn't eat fish. These are gross. But what I loved about it was at that age, open to new things. Huh, well, maybe you should give this fish thing a try. Because when we're in preschool, when we're little tiny folks, we don't think we've got the world by a string. We don't think we know it all. We have to get to be teenagers before we know everything, right? At least that was me. But if, when we're those little children, we're willing to say, okay, I'll take what you say on faith. What if every day, as children of God, we woke up and just said, I'm going to wake up with a broken heart. I'm going to start the day of repenting. Even for things I haven't even done yet and just say, I don't got this. I'm not going to make it work. Lord, Heavenly Father, I need you. 2 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest uh, evangelist missionaries, men of God in the history of the faith. But he writes about his easygoing life when he says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food. Well, that would explain the hunger part. But in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure of me, of my anxiety for all the churches. Verse 29, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? The Apostle Paul says, I am weak. The Apostle Paul says, look at all this stuff going on. He certainly wasn't waking up in the morning and saying, I got this, no problem, piece of cake. I need my Father in heaven. I need Christ. If we began every day, instead of thinking we've got it all together, but thinking, I need Christ. A broken heart, not a hardened heart. Might we get to the astounded part with a little less trouble? Verse 49 and 50. 
also a, a wonderful image. That these disciples in their boat, tired, frustrated, probably a bit angry that Jesus told them to do this. They're, they're in there rowing or, or fighting the wind away. And then in verse 49, they see Jesus walking on the sea. And when they see Jesus walking on the sea, they think it's a ghost, so they start crying out. And I'm glad they put the out there, because wouldn't that sound bad if it just said cry? They just started crying, you know, so scared. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Don't be afraid. So if we start the day with a broken heart, admitting our sinfulness, our inadequacy, where is our courage going to come? not going to come from us. Courage is not going to come from our capability if we're admitting, admitting that we are incapable. Then our courage would have to come from Christ. And that was the problem the disciples had. The disciples were limiting their thinking only to what they experienced, what they knew. And people don't walk on the ocean. So it's got to be a ghost. But Jesus gets in the boat and says, take heart. It is I. And in the original Greek in this, I need a go, it's literally, I am. Jesus' statement of his deity, similar to the way God revealed himself to Moses, when Moses asked, who do I tell Pharaoh, send me? And God says in Exodus 3, tell him the I am sent you. The I am, the only one that is beyond space and time. The only one that can say, I exist now. You and I can only exist in the future or in the past, but the moment we try to say, I am, time is flown by. We can't say that. It's like trying to pinpoint a spot in a rushing stream. The only one that can truly, honestly say, I am, is somebody that is outside time and space and all the laws that apply. And that is our God. That is our Savior. And he says, take courage. I am. You're not. You can't walk on water, at least not ordinarily. You, you suffer from the horrible pressure of the wind keeping you back. You can't do a multitude of things, and you fail at even many of the things you can do. But take heart. Your courage doesn't come from you. It comes from me, the I am. Where does your courage come from? What are you afraid to face, afraid to admit? Afraid to feel you. Well, where does your courage come from? You or Christ? In verse 51 through 52, he gets into the boat with them and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. This is one of the great dangers of our Christian faith understanding. Where is your confidence in your Christian faith? Is your confidence in your comprehension or your confession? There's a lot of wonderfully, uh, just amazingly trained Bible scholars in our, the midst of our church. We have folks that have memorized so much scripture. It amazes me. Uh, we have wonderful Bible studies. I mean, so many people in our church are blessed with a deep knowledge of scripture. It, it, it overwhelms me sometimes. But when it comes to the confidence in the faith, as we're sailing through life and feeling bogged down by the storms, exhausted and tired, what gives us confidence to go on? Is it our comprehension in understanding what God is doing, what God is saying? I mean, logically, we take his words and apply our uh, knowledge of language and we, we listen to them and hear them and process them. But the disciples, when they saw the, the, the bread being distributed to far more people than humanly possible, their mind couldn't comprehend it. And it says their heart was hardened. Why? They didn't understand it. Well, if I don't understand it, then I, I'm just, I'm probably just not going to think about it because it's just too weird. Wait, there's somebody walking on water. I don't understand that. I, I have no comprehension of walking on water. I mean, think about that. How did that work? What would that look like? Was he, was Jesus kind of hovering? 
like you know, over the water, kind of you know, like a hoverboard looking thing. Was he stepping on the water, and then when the waves came, he kind of step up and then down and then up and then, I mean, how does that work? Did he just kind of cruise through the upper layer like a wave behind him, like a motorboat? How would that look? You and I have no comprehension of how somebody can walk on water. And the disciples see this, and it does not occur to them, oh, that's the Lord, or that's a human being. In their comprehension, it's got to be a ghost. What else can walk on water? But if that's where we place our confidence, we are always going to be afraid. Because all throughout Scripture, the Lord does and says things that are beyond our human intellect. We have to put confidence in our confession. Thus saith the Lord. This we know to be true. Well, how does it work? I don't know. You're telling me that Christ is truly present in the, in the, the wine and the bread of the sacrament? Yep. How does that work? Having a clue. Pretty bizarre. I confess it. Don't comprehend it. You know what the scary thing is? is if you look at all the times God comes to his people, Old New Testament, and asks them to do things. How many times does he ask them to do things that are possible? Very seldom. Maybe like, get me a donkey. Or do you have anything to eat? But almost always, like in the case we read this morning of Noah and the ark, God asks the impossible. We assume that if God asks us to do something, it must be possible. Like the Ten Commandments. Well, God said to do them, it must therefore be possible. Why? In fact, the opposite is true. They're not. For any of us. It was not humanly possible to build a giant ship and collect two of every animal on the earth and write out a flood that destroyed the world. God had a big hand in that. But notice when God comes to people, he tells them to do things that are impossible. Christ tells the disciples, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be killed and rise again. And at first the disciples say, okay, crazy. Don't talk about that. Why? It's not possible. Why is it not possible? I can't comprehend it. And if we live that way, we will live in fear. As opposed to putting our confidence in our confession. I did a terrible thing when I was a uh, high school student. I did a lot of terrible things, but good kid in high school. Eric Dehan was his name. And poor Eric was one of these guys that he was class president, and uh, he was just a good kid, and, uh, but a simple kid, very, very trusting kid. And Eric, every day in his lunch, got Twinkie. And that bothered some of us because we didn't get Twinkies. Uh, we, we didn't get anything good like that. We'd get like an apple. Or, or something gross. He got a twin every day. And, and we, in our jealousy, somehow one day figured out that during the class breaks, we would go into his lunch, get his Twinkie out, and you know those little stir sticks you stir coffee with? You stir cream in the coffee, they're really tiny. We figured out we could stick one of those in the wrapper and then into the Twinkie, and we could suck out all the cream filling from his Twinkie. And you could not tell that the, the Twinkie had been disturbed. So for at least a month, this poor guy thinks that the Twinkie company is out to get him. And he was so confused and so upset. But what really came back to bite us was we found out that in his frustration, because he could not comprehend how you could get Twinkie without filling unless it happened from the company, he wrote a letter to the Twinkie company complaining that his Twinkies had no cream filling. And you know what they did? They sent him a free case of Twinkies. He got more Twinkies. And then we gave up. But think about how many things we assume because the truth is just not within the comprehension of our experience. As Christians, the disciples themselves, if they would have just said, Jesus does miracles. Somebody walking on water? Yeah, probably Jesus. Could have skipped the afraid part, the screaming and crying into those, and gone straight to the astounding part. This is 
well. And lastly, in verse 51, he got out of the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were astounded. The question we always need to ask is, are we seeking power from his presence or our purpose? Notice the text says that he comes to them walking on the sea and says he meant to pass by them. Now, depending on how you translate that, it could mean come alongside, or it could mean that he was intending to get in front of them and lead them as Christ is wanting to do, pick up your cross and follow me. But as they're sitting there in the boat, exhausted, trying to get to where they're supposed to go, remember, Jesus is the one that told them to go there. And they're trying painfully to work those oars, those sails, and that wind. Obviously, their own power, even though they had what they knew was a God-given purpose to get to the other side, they weren't doing it. And a lot of times in modern Christianity, we hear a lot about our purpose. We hear a lot about, you know, here's what God has for you to do. It's great. God has all sorts of wondrous things for all of us to do and to be and to become. And most of them, we can't even imagine them. But the question is, where do you get the power to do those things and to become those things? Is it from your sense of purpose? Okay, got it now, God, here I go. Or is it from his power? You ever listen to a beautiful trumpet? And the music, the, the majestic music that comes out of that trumpet. What does the trumpet do to produce that music? Well, not that it can do anything, but at least it doesn't jump out of the hands of the musician. A trumpet is just a, a vessel for the breath of the musician to make beautiful music. We accomplish God's purpose through us by being a vessel for Him. That's why when we come to church, we, we don't come to just feel better about ourselves. So we don't come to just get a, a few more lists of things that we can do to better ourselves. We come to be in the presence of God, the presence of Christ in his word, the presence of Christ in his sacraments, because it is only the presence of God that gives us the power to reach his intended purpose. Isaiah 43, 1 through 3 tells us, Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. My prayer for you this week is whatever boat you're in, metaphorically speaking, Whatever headway you are not making because you're painfully fighting against whatever is working against you, whatever exhaustion you're experiencing, whatever fear is overcoming you, ask yourself these questions. Do you begin the day with a broken heart or a hardened heart? Do you begin the day willing to admit that you are a sinner and that you are incapable of virtually anything without your Lord and Savior? Is your courage being placed upon your own capability, which fails, or on Christ, who never fails? Is your confidence being put in your comprehension of the world around you, or even the words of God? Or is it placed in your confession? This I know the Lord says, and it's true, even if I don't understand it. And the power that gets you from point A to point B from age to age, from day to day, are you seeking this from your own purpose, your own drive, or from His presence, the reality of His being in your life through His Word, through the Supper, through your baptism? My prayer is that like the disciples, you will be constantly astounded in Christ. My prayer also, however, is unlike the disciples, maybe we can avoid a little of that fear and a little of that sense of frustration that the disciples had to experience in their lives. That is my prayer for us this week in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together at this time. Will you please rise?
dearest Father in heaven, strengthen our faith. Father, we come to you to be in your presence because we've all got some bad folks. Father, all of us have so many frustrations, so many things in which we feel helpless. Father, this morning we're going to things that we, we probably don't want to even think about because we just think it's too much, too overwhelming, and there's just no hope. Father, as we put ourselves in the place of your disciples and feel their struggle and their exhaustion, their sense of being overwhelmed, Father, strengthen our faith as you strengthen, strengthen theirs. Remind us to put our confidence, our hope only in you. Father, as we go forward in this coming week, may we truly put our faith in you even when we don't understand it. Father, may we accept the power that you bring even when we feel powerless. And Father, may we have the, the courage to admit every day that without you we are nothing, that our hearts are broken in sin, and that the moment we understand that truth, revive us, Father, with the awesome reality of your forgiveness, your love, and the hope we have of an eternal destiny. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of faith. Thank you so much for all the, the folks around us that, that strengthen and encourage our faith and ask that this coming week may be a wonderful one, filled with confidence, not in ourselves, but in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, we have lifted the folks in our church today that are not feeling well or suffering in any way. Um, just, Father, we ask your blessing upon their health, those that we have listed in our bulletin. We thank you, Father, for those that are recovering and ask that you would speed up that recovery if it is your will to make them whole. Father, for those that are out traveling still and on vacation, bring them home safely, Father. Bring them rest. We thank you, Father, for those that have returned safely this week. We also ask your blessing, Father, on the, the, the rest of this summer. It's been a tough year for A lot of us are just tired and, and uh, in need of rest and relaxation. So, Father... Please provide that sense of peace and rest as we come to the, the latter part of this summer break. Father, may all in our church be able to rest in the knowledge that whatever is happening, good or bad, you are in absolute control and making all things good. Lord, we love you. We give thanks for you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And together we pray the simple prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. some of you for dinner tonight. We're going to have a, a wonderful time and uh, after a couple of glasses of wine, learn all sorts of secrets and uh, no, it, uh, it is going to be a blessed time to get to know you. And if you have not been able to join us for dinner, I can still like <coughs> to get to know you better and uh, let's try to arrange something because the, the three minutes in the narthex at the church uh, just aren't enough. I really want to get to know you and your history and, and uh, any good story you have to tell about your time at the church. But above all, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.
just do it in a second. I'm trying to do it all fast. <laughs> 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 